bam 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 Miami, FLA Hitchhiked away across USA Plucked her eyebrows on the way Shaved her legs and then he was a she She says, hey babe, take a walk on the wild side Said, hey honey, take a walk on the wild side <laughs> participate in a cable adventure which reaches from the outer limits to your inner sanctum. You are experiencing the sight and sound of MTV. By the 1970s, rock music had started to take itself very seriously indeed. In Britain, the predominant trend was for progressive rock, performed in vast stadiums and released as concept albums. If a song wasn't at least 20 minutes long, it wasn't worth playing. In America, many successful musicians of the 60s had by now settled into comfortable Beverly Hills lifestyles, playing music for the all-powerful FM radio. Typical of such bands were the Eagles, who came to epitomize a radio-friendly Californian rock sound. At its most powerful, rock and roll had always appeared to offer a way of life. Yet the lavish trappings of mid-70s rock culture suggested it was in danger of becoming just another leisure industry. The music needed a new injection of energy. And it got it. There was nothing else but pompous stadium rock, and, uh, and it was all catered towards... Um, snobby university students. There was nothing there for Joe Bloggs in the street. I guess what was real popular in those days was um, disco and corporate rock, bands like Boston and Foreigner Journey, Toto. Dinosaur. The dinosaur bands, they never really 
they left you as they found you. I so I felt they took, they took, they picked you up, took your money, left you in a field somewhere, you know, and you, you were the same after you'd seen them, except they were richer. <laughs> the Eagles, the Doobie Brothers, <laughs> and, um, you know, Linda Ronstadt. You didn't see any bands that excited you when you wanted to be excited, so you just thought, well, uh, maybe, maybe you can do that, or maybe you and your friends can have a band too. All right. That's right. The first stirrings of a new direction came from a young Boston guitarist who wrote short, direct songs about love and suburbia. Well, out in the afternoon, out in the arid plain, we'll share a modern love under suburban rain. Uh, rock and roll was about stuff that was natural anyway. Or was it about drugs and space? It's about sex and boyfriends and girlfriends and stuff. And act like a true girl. Oh. See, I used to walk to the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. And I used to go to the room where they would keep the paintings by Cezanne, see? Not because I understood anything about the paintings of Cezanne, but that's where all the BU girls hung out. B Boston University, BU, Boston University. They had the... Uh, they had the... Uh, big suede boots coming up to here and they had the Galois cigarettes and they had the long hair and the brown suede jacket. Ooh, and I was very impressed. So I just hung around there. And I figured, boy, if I had a girlfriend, I could understand these paintings and I could see right through them. That's a girl. Considered too eccentric to ever achieve much commercial success, the album that Jonathan Richmond and his group, The Modern Lovers, recorded in 1973 was enormously influential when it reached New York. One, two, three, four, five, six. Run, 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 run. Going faster miles an hour. Songs like Roadrunner reminded people of an earlier age, when the music the radio played was short, fun, and above all, easy to play, as long as someone counted in the intro. A time when the so-called garage bands of the 60s had had more enthusiasm than ability and you could sing along to the chorus. A time when rock and roll had been fun. A New York rock musician and critic decided to not only reissue some of the old garage band records, but to start playing them himself. Um, I, I often think of uh, garage music as the real reason why people want to rock and roll in the first place, which is just pure desire. Too many teardrops for one heart to be crying. The garage bands became more important to their style in the early 70s because Rock and roll had gotten very complicated. Uh, progressive rock, a sense that rock was an adult medium, uh, a sense that complexity and song cycles and uh, instrumental prowess and musicianship were the driving force. One, two, three, four! The fact that you could play three chords and get up on a stage within a week was being lost. <laughs> Joining Lenny Kay to play some of these old garage band songs was the New York poet, Patti Smith. I used to work at a bookstore. I was a writer. Uh, and yet we loved the initial spark of rock and roll. Um, and all of this kind of uh, met and hung out together in, uh, in, a, in a kind of unique mix that nobody could have predicted would have been heard anywhere but, you know, the Lower East Side of Manhattan. New York is the thing that seduced me. New York is the thing that formed me. New York is the thing that deformed me. 
New York is the thing that perverted me. New York is the thing that converted me. And New York's the thing I love, too. <laughs> We weren't really sure what we were doing. We had a piano player, and he would play a few songs with Patty. Then she'd do some poems. Then I'd get up and do a couple guitar pieces. But there was never uh, a feeling that uh, we could have any kind of uh, co commercial success out of it. There was the Mercer Art Center performances, and they were poetry readings that drew attention to her interest in rock and roll more, more than in poetry, kind of. And this longing in a person to really be a, a, a singer and a performing artist rather than poet. So the boundaries of the poetry would always be pushed in that direction. Freedom is inside of me. It means that I'm not hung up with like anybody's idea of how I should be. You know, I'm an artist. Rock and roll is my art. I'm a nigger of the universe. I can leap up and scream. I can put my fist up in the air. I don't give a shit. I think there was a deep desire in Patty to be, be kind of like Keith Richard. Boy, oh, looked at Johnny. Johnny wanted to run, but the movie kept moving as planned. The boy gripped Johnny. He pressed him against a locker. He drove it in, he drove it home. He drove it deep in Johnny. The boy disappeared. Johnny fell on his knees, started pushing his head against the locker. Started it, pushing his head against Patti Smith's often improvised lyrics drew on the increasing toughness of New York City life. Other groups would soon do the same. Well, when people ask about the song Marquee Moon, it's, it really actually came out of walking to a rehearsal. And you can actually see the moon out during the day in New York sometimes. And it, I think I was even walking on 42nd Street. And, there were these marquees out, and there was the moon out, and the whole thing was like a combination of electric light and natural bright sunlight. When, when Richard Hell and I would write, it'd be, I'd be hanging around playing guitar, and, and he'd uh, I'd bang out something and go, let's, let's use that, and we'd sort of make that into a song, and usually the next day he'd come with a bunch of lyrics and throw them on top of the guitar stuff. I was saying, let me out of here before I was even born. I was saying, let me out of here before I was even born. It's such a gamble when you get a face. I belong to the blank generation. And I can take it or leave it each time. I belong to the blank generation, and I can take it or leave it each time. Well, the hippie culture is what we wanted to replace. It, would, it failed, and it was pathetic. All these leftover people trying to pretend that, uh, um, you know, handing out flowers was going to beat Nixon, <laughs> you know. The New York Dolls and the sort of glamour groups had long hair. We decided to forget that, you know, and the costumes and all that. We hated all this stuff. It seemed like, a, like not even funny pretense to us. And um, so we just sort of wore street clothes, which also happened to have, in some cases, safety pins. I belong to the generation, but... I we sure it didn't look like any band in the world. I mean, we're the only band that had short hair, probably, in the world. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> everybody worshipped us for it. They'd crawl into CPGBs. They'd, they were stacked up like... like, like like these tires. Um, 
So thirsty were they for reality. <laughs> CBGB's was the only club that would at first let television and the Patti Smith group play. They were joined there by a group who seemed to have even less commercial potential. Four teenagers changed their names and with the cry, all for one and one for all, became the Ramones. I, oh, let's go. We first played CBGB's in, I think it was August of 1974. Basically, uh, I think it was a country and western bar in the, in the Bowery in New York, which is uh, like a skid row section. Uh, I don't want to get involved with you. That's not what I want to do. <laughs> and that's the things we would write about when we first started. Uh, the boredom of what to do. We just had to write about what came natural instead of singing love songs about cars. We didn't have this stuff. Uh, really weren't having, probably having difficulty finding a girlfriend, so we really couldn't sing about love and all this. So we sang about just boredom, glue sniffing. The Ramones took Jonathan Richmond's simple guitar sound even further. The rule was, no more than three chords per song. Yeah, I remember, um, you know, we auditioned for Hilly. And uh, Hilly said, um, nobody's going to like you guys, but I'll have you back. When the Ramones first started performing, uh, they were a pretty crude band, uh, and they got so within a few months they were doing you know pretty decent garagey rock and roll I think our initial set was seven eight songs because I think that's all that's that was the only songs we knew how to play you know we, that's all. and we play very short songs well I guess they were long songs played quickly you know, you felt like if somebody doesn't like the song, you'd be over to the next song before they know it, so that they won't get too restless. He always did all the counting on the songs. Don't know why. This came came natural for him. He did it really well. Just counted to four well. We thought we were playing bubblegum music. You know, sort of like a sick bubblegum music, and uh, yeah, which became punk. Other women with punk attitudes followed Patti Smith onto the CBGB stage, including a former waitress from Max's Kansas City. frustrating in the, in the 70s was trying to play an instrument in a band and I remember going to jam sessions and being told oh you can't play your girl you know and that really hurt <laughs> mm -hmm. we were really sort of rebelling against the, the flatness of everything we wanted to have sort of a a really sort of fun thing, and I sometimes felt like a cartoon figure. While Blondie were very different from television and Patti Smith, it was this sort of eclectic mix and openness to experimentation which was part of the strength of CBGB's growing punk scene. Among the audience drawn to the club were three college graduates who decided to get up and perform themselves. The name of this band is Talking Heads, and the name of this song is Psycho Killer. Don't touch me, I'm a real liar. 
it, it almost seems as if I shoved myself on stage out of some desperate need. We thought, why not sing about what we're really thinking? We don't feel like heroes. We don't feel like rock stars. Why don't we uh, be honest about this? And it seemed to work. It was a, a gratifying thing to go out there and, and uh, express all your insecurity while you're on a stage. Can't sleep. That's on fire. Don't touch me. I'm a real live fire. David Byrne, you know, was uh, then in his chicken mode. He was uh, very jerky. I'm talking about his movements. I didn't know him personally. <laughs> All the bands had kind of their look, um, and our look was one of, you know, the clothes that our mom sent us at Christmas time, basically. <laughs> you know, that we didn't have any money to go out, and, and, and if we did, we certainly weren't going to spend it on, like, platform boots. <laughs> Psycho Killer I wrote, um, not seriously. I think I was writing it just to see if I could write a song. It was always very exciting for us to do something that we didn't quite understand. The biggest thrill was to kind of be all thumbs and not to be capable or technically proficient, but to be a bit all thumbs. So I was playing to the point where my fingers were bleeding, and I remember that people would get very excited when, when the blood would start running down my pick guard. Punk wasn't a musical style, or at least it shouldn't have been, and to many people it turned into a, a particular musical style. It was more a kind of do-it-yourself, anyone can do it kind of attitude. If you only play two notes on the guitar, you, you can figure out a way to make a song out of that. And that's, that's what it's about. But Houston, Detroit, and Pittsburgh hadn't yet heard Talking Heads, or indeed any other punk band. One thing about America, America always played it safe and, and always plays it safe, you know? And so they were, they were threatened by the punk. The record companies were very afraid of it, and, and it was a really verboten. You know, they just would not play it on the radio. Radio in America, anyway, FM radio, had, had this idea that they only played good music, you know, by good musicians, and that punk was not good music by good musicians. It was like kids making a lot of noise or something. To most people in radio, it didn't sound as good as the Eagles or Linda Ronstadt and so it didn't get played. I remember one time we went to play in Nashville and we were driving into town um, and we said, hey, let's pick up some of the local radio and we turned it on and we heard the local DJ saying, yes, boys and girls, punk is coming to town for the first time, maybe the last time. By 1975, it seemed as if the punk scene was destined to stay in the privileged possession of a small clique of musicians in New York and the odd journalist, an almost private pleasure. Jesus died for somebody's sins, but not mine. Milton out of thieves Wild cord of my sleeve Thick heart of stone My sins my own They belong to me Middle America was perhaps too affluent for punk To gain acceptance, it would need to go elsewhere
An astute London manager had visited New York and brought back with him many of the ideas he had witnessed. The clothes, the haircuts, and above all, the attitude. When I came back to London, armed with that experience, I created a shop that I titled Set. And at the same time as selling all these, I suppose, more obvious leather and fetish and rubber artifacts, I had to express my own uh, uh, desire and designs and feelings inside this, what I would call, sex wear culture. And the best way I thought I could start was to write on the simplest T-shirt two lists of people one list that I thought were dreadful and horrible, and one list that I thought were cool and generated perhaps a new idea. That was my beginning. Young people started to come into the shop, not to necessarily buy the leather gags or the whips, but to buy these bloody T-shirts. Well, sooner or later, I had a vast army of these kids who I discovered were the dispossessed fans of David Bowie, Roxy Music, etc., who were looking for something of their own. Some of those kids came into my store with the notion that they wanted to start a group. Jones was a fashion victim, no question, but he was an extraordinary thief. He drove me mad. I would always be bloody running down the King's Road after him because he'd stolen a pair of trousers or a pair of shoes or this and the other. But I liked him. I don't know why, I just liked him. I first saw Johnny Rotten, John Lydon at the time, when he came in uh, Malcolm's shop, and it was Let It Rock at the time, and I thought he looked really good. He had, like, a... Uh, you know, the green hair going and the safety pin thing happening. But he just had, like, a really unique kind of face. Please, I try so hard to be nice. And I said, well, would you like to sing in a band? And he said, no, no, I don't sing, only out of tune. I said, well, that's not a problem. No, 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 I want to play the violin. I said, would you play the violin? He said, no, 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 only out of tune. He was a right stroppy little bugger. We, we uh, told him to come back, like, a week later and he sang to the jukebox in the, uh, in the shop. I said, what song do you want to sing, John? I ain't sing. Just mime to a song and get at the end of the shop and use this. It was a shower, uh, a shower attachment. I don't know what I was doing with it in the shop, but I had a shower attachment. Pretend this is a microphone. You're on the stage. Mime to this song. <laughs> I'd been told that I would never amount to very much, would never achieve anything just because of my social status. And we don't care! When I started, I didn't have much really to uh, use as a source of inspiration. I didn't want to sound like anybody else out there or, or come up with versions of things that had already been done. So, uh, my sources were film, theatre, and Richard III really fitted into that brilliantly. If the sword on swayed, if the king dead, the empire must put it! Because uh, Olivia's performance was outrageously over the top. Anyone can be nice. I loved Steve's guitar playing. Absolutely loved it. Every now and again, there'd be a bum note, but he'd be clever enough to make it sound like it should have been there. And that's how I actually first la learned how to play. I would take, like, I wake up in the morning, take a black beauty, and just play till like, my fingers were like bleeding. 
over like one little bit for like five hours. <laughs> you know, that's why we sounded like we did. You know, John couldn't sing and I couldn't play guitar. When I was finally cajoled and forced to find a, a, a rehearsal room for him and his merry bunch, um, and went along out of curiosity one Sunday afternoon, I was amazed to see I was, it was like en entering an Aladdin's cave. There were banks of equipment that you may have seen at Woodstock or Isle of Wight festivals. I thought, well, who knows, has he got all this equipment? Well, it was obvious they'd stolen the whole bloody lot. This is a jazz club, and I guess it always had a history of, like, being a jazz club. And um, I just never forget seeing the pistols, and as opposed to people trying to get close to the stage, people were actually backing off and, like, kind of clinging to the walls and saying, let me out of here. And it kind of, um, it was great the way the band and uh, um, Leiden at the time kind of fed off on that. Susie was just one of many punks to start performing herself as the movement started to grow in London. John Lydon suddenly found himself the spokesman for a whole bored generation. You start off in school and they take your soul away. They take your brains away. You're not allowed to have an opinion that differs from theirs. Punk in Britain was both more aggressive and literally more spiky than its American cousin. The Pistols' first single in 1976 marked its cultural year zero. Going up to then, really, I think he was mind games for the middle classes, something university students would dabble with in between lunch breaks. Uh, I just chucked it right in there into the wonderful world of pop. The very first impression of John was really quite scary. And there's a sort of pasty-faced sort of waxy apparition with sort of spiky peroxided hair and this huge, great big long white Mac. And he just sort of sat there and didn't say anything. I said, would you like to do the vocal then? He said, well, that's what I'm here for. <laughs> so he went out there and just started screaming against the backing chart. I was like, oh my God, what are we gonna do here? <laughs> to the point where I was mixing Anarchy and it was about four o'clock in the morning and John came down and he was going, that's our anthem. And, you know, he was really, really excited about it and the band really did gel together. They really wanted to make a great record. There was no messing about. They're a group called the Sex Pistols and I'm surrounded now by all of them. We was uh, rehearsing down in Kilburn. All of a sudden, a couple of blows come in I said, there's a limo here. You're going to go down and do the uh, Today Show. Is that what it was? And because Queen couldn't do it, they had to cancel. Are they? We thought we were going to be talking about the tour and the record, Anarchy. Well, suppose they turn he just wanted to, like, you know, make us look silly. It's what? Nothing, a rude word. Next question. No, no. What was the rude word? Shit. Was it really? Good heavens, you So it developed into a huge swearing match. Yeah, you're dead, isn't it? And all the angst and frustration of a group that basically was born out of hating each other was spewed forth towards this paralytic creature who was incredibly horrid and anti this group. 
beckoning them and goading them on. Go on, you've got another five you seconds. Say something outrageous. You dirty bastard. Go on, again. <laughs> you dirty fucker. What a clever boy. What a yeah. fucking rotter. Well, that's it for tonight. <laughs> At that point, the show was cut dead. Hey, well, I'm saying nothing else about it. Police were called, the phones were jammed. We were now outside on the street in the same car that came to uh, pick us up from the rehearsal room. And I sat in that car and I said, by God, by accident rather than design, you've just seriously made history, you guys. So was to begin the media feeding frenzy that accompanied the Pistols for the rest of their careers as they pinballed between record companies and publicity stunts. Helped by the addition of Sid Vicious on bass, they became fixed in the press's imagination as public enemies number one. You know, it messed things up as far as... Uh destroying the band a lot quicker and uh, the music went out the window wasn't in, wasn't that wasn't the focus then it was more like you know what what we're going to do next what outrageous thing we're going to do next <laughs> The Queen's Silver Jubilee of 1977 presented the perfect opportunity. Hiring a riverboat on the night itself, the pistols played as it cruised down the Thames. God save the Queen. She ain't no human being. She made you a moron, a potential H-bomb. There's no future. That's prophetic. You will have no future if you don't make one for yourself. It's as simple as that. If you accept the forms that be, then you are doomed to your own ultimate blandness. <laughs> I, at that point, realised that God Save the Queen was going to be a massive record. Even though it wasn't being played on the radio, even though you couldn't see the group play, enough records were being sold to make it number one. But the number one, for the first time in the history of the record industry, was a black mark, because they refused to print the name of the Sex Pistols with the name God Save the Queen. I seemed to escape it all and was seemingly doing incredibly well in business in my shop. I was selling a hell of a lot of bondage trousers. By the time of the Jubilee, punk had gone up like a rocket in Britain. With remarkable speed, the look had spread to every high street in the country. Um, they got their ideas usually from the Daily Mirror or the Sun, and how to be a punk. Punk kit, ten top tips. <laughs> what were they? Lesson one. Well, the proverbial leather jacket, which of course none of us wore at that time. How to spike your hair, what stuff to buy at Boots Chemist, uh, where to get the best safety pins. It was all nonsense. Utter rubbish. The pistols themselves found it increasingly difficult either to be on the streets or even perform in public. So they retreated to the studio with producer Chris Thomas, where, ironically, he spent more time overdubbing the tracks for their next album than he had on Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon. But in some parts of the country, punk genuinely struck three new chords. One, two, three, four. It was quite easy to be our own band because we lived in Manchester. And so we were always seen as being the cousins from out of town, almost like from the country when we went down to London. So other London bands used to be interested in us because we were but not part of that rat race or that big wheel that everyone was going round and round it. Being in Manchester helped us to maintain and also build upon our own identity. What do I get? Once the uh, 
the Grundy incident happened, I think there was like there was a, a snapshot taken, which was circulated around, and people could either you know be like it or be able to re recognise people who were like it. Well, there's people banding this that they're saying that I'm, I'm violent obscene. Do I look violent obscene? I suppose one of the things that punk brought was the fact that the songs were short and therefore they were more like uh, pop songs they used to be. Um, and I thought one of the easiest things to do, especially with a, a, a pop song, is, uh, is to do it with um, uh, just the, you know, the inner turmoil of, uh, of, 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 of having no one to love and no one to to love you back, uh, and the constant uh, yearning for that. We decided to make our own record, um, only because we found out that we could do. And uh, songs we raised five hundred pounds. We could uh, get hold of a thousand copies of our record, all nicely pressed up, and sell them as a pound each. So that gets five hundred pounds profit. So it's like easy money. And even if we only sold five hundred, we'd still come out with money. <laughs> On the day when they, they all arrived from the factory, and we had the sleeves in one pile, and we had the records in the other, we used to. I used to sit at the kitchen table with an angled poise lamp, carefully looking at the things to make sure that none of them were scratched. Well, I mean, not rather than the spiral one. At the time, we never intended it to be anything special, but it spawned a monster. <laughs> Just when punk was in danger of becoming a monotonous format, a London band who had started at around the same time as the Pistols branched out in a new, unexpected direction. A lot of our stuff was uh, written overlooking Westfall, because we were up in the flats uh, where I live with my grandmother, and uh, we used to just look out, and it was very high up. It was on the 18th floor, so we could see all of the all of the area, you know. And um, also underneath the Westway, someone had sprayed the clash on one of the pillars that held up the Westway, and it, it seemed to mark out our area. The Clash's roots in the squats of Notting Hill gave their music a political edge and a sense of shared comradeship with the local black community. The train's been stopped, and down below on the Portobello Road, there's swirling chaos and looting. It's not the way. When the Clash really first started, I was about 17, and really it was a strange period because, I mean, you can walk down Portobello, and you can hear a bit of reggae out the speaker over here. And then over here, they're playing Latin music or further down, there's rockabilly. It's quite strange if you stand in the middle and hear all these uh, influences all at the same time. The influence that was really to affect the clash was reggae. Roxy, I don't know, it held about 2,000 people, and obviously they were all punks. And I was the DJ, and um, I lived in a house with about four, other, four or five other Rasta guys. When I got the job, they all laughed at me. Ha ha, Don Letts is gonna work with those crazy punk rockers. And the funny thing was, it was so early in the days of punk rock that there weren't actually any punk records to play at that time. So I had to play something that I liked, primarily, and that happened to be my first love, which was reggae. 
And it seemed that the punk rockers could relate to it. I guess because it was the only rebellious sound around at the time. whether to cover uh, another record because we had enough ammunition of our own but we just sort of like the inclusion of that reggae feel <laughs> guitar was quite heavy, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't doing that skank, it was like kind of punk guitar on it. And we weren't trying to play reggae, so we were trying to just do our thing. And uh, like much in the way the 60s bands uh, used to cover contemporary R&B classics, we covered what was the latest record from Jamaica. It happened to be Police and Fees, it all kind of fit in with what was going on at the time, you know. Some of the guys in the class were in the riots. A lot of white people would say, oh, reggae's really boring, the bass is always the same. But when you're actually in one of those clubs, you, you understand why the bass is as it is, because it's something to move to. It's, it's your footsteps, it's the, it's the feel, and, and that's an aspect that you can only really find out by being in, in a club. The Clash were not the only punk band to be drawn to reggae. By reggae, we were. That's why we were different. But um, but in generally, the attitude about reggae related to it because it's the rebelliousness, the utter rebelliousness, because we were just rebellious by nature. <laughs> Ariana became so engrossed in it that, you know, she had longer dreadlocks than me and spoke um, Jamaican heavier than me and it became quite disconcerting because she was from Germany. I'll surely give it back to you tomorrow Where each has for the money, I just buy to life, be better in 76, I heard reggae and I was interested to the music, not because of Jamaicans, because I didn't really know Jamaicans, I haven't seen any, but I heard the music first and it hit, it hit a hardcore thing in me, right? So from that, I just have make my way to Jamaica. Not all punks actually went there, but increasingly, Jamaica came to be a powerful force in their music. Kingston in the 70s was a musical pressure cooker, with DJs producing records in their shops and testing them out on an audience that same night. Nothing would get bought unless it had a wicked bass line you could dance to. A voracious record-buying public had fueled the development of reggae out of its earlier incarnations of ska and rock steady. But the man who exported it to a worldwide audience was Bob Marley. One of the many Jamaicans who had left his native countryside to come to the capital, in his music he mixed his reactions to the urban life of Kingston with a spiritual longing for Rastafarian redemption. I think that reggae has some identity with that very first instance when music was introduced within creation because that's the only way it could have identified with all races that it doesn't matter what language you speak, 
when you hear that beat, there's something in that beat that everyone identifies and understands. In this When you listen to a foreign record, when I say foreign, I mean anything that's made outside of Jamaica. It could be in America, it could be even the same reggae artist. The way the, in, the engineers have this little way out attitude with them, right? You go into the studio, they have all the equipment to do everything. And you crank up the bass, my God, man, turn it down, turn it down, you're gonna blow my speakers, right? And you take the same equipment and come to Jamaica, and these guys crank it up, man. The producer who cranked up the bass for the Wailers and later for The Clash was Lee Perry, whose house band were called the Upsetters, as he himself was often known for good reason. Because I am what I am, and I am he that I am. I am the Upsetter. I am Love Creator. I sit upon the Equator. I'm a technological star. I'm not a reggae star. I'm a technological star. Yeah. Black and white and mix. Lee Perry welcomed the opportunity to work with punks as part of his perpetual quest to do things differently. Often called the Phil Spector of reggae, he finally burnt down his famous Black Ark studio in protest at the iniquities of the Jamaican record business. So we're going to the studio. The drum represents the heartbeat. The bass is a thought, the line that flies. Walking bass, talking bass come from here. That's the brain. Boom, boom is from here, the heart. If it wasn't for the white folks, I don't think reggae music would be where it is today. Because from the very first instance that the Wailers came on stage in London, you know, you felt that you were accepted. Because of that, you know, that quick to accept kind of attitude that white folks have, recognizing things of value very fast. The Wailers started to get real international success in 1977, just at the time punk was breaking. In my musical travels, I had occasion to become friends with Bob Marley, and in fact, punk rock caused an argument between us, because one day I went round his house, and I had on my bondage trousers, and he said, Don, let's, we are deal with, mountaineering. And I said, no, Bob, this is the thing now, it's punk rock, and he's like, nah, get out of here. And, um... Sure enough, three months later, he made a record called Punky Reggae Party. After seeing The Clash play, Bob Marley wrote and recorded the song with Lee Perry. So come with your heart and soul. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And let's have a punky reggae party all night. If we can learn to do a little of everything, then it makes your market better. Because a little punk in reggae could work. The man who loves punk would buy that song because there's a little of his thing in it. <laughs> the Clash, keen to authenticate their love of reggae, sought a new collaborator in Mikey Dread. At first, I didn't care whether the punks like reggae or not. As I said originally, my aim is to make reggae music universal in every way I can. So by me, Adding some of the reggae to whatever else is happening commercially would bring reggae music to a different audience, you know what I mean? Meeting Mikey Dredd made a big difference for me, really, because he'd come over from Jamaica and uh, came to join us on tour. I didn't know The Clash was like some superheroes, you know what I mean? So we went in there, and when I heard the type of music that they had, they had this first song called Daddy Was A Bank Robber, and it was really fast. I could hardly even get the words right. 
So I said, yo, you know, I like the project, but I don't want to do the project if I'm just going to collect money from the project and I don't like anything. So I said, you know, if we're going to work together, I want to put in some of me into your thing and see how well we can do it together. came out good because Paul, who is the bass player, he was really into reggae music. I went to his house in Labro Grove and I saw more reggae music than a lot of other West Indian people could actually have in their house. And I was surprised that he was listening to a wide cross-section of reggae, not just commercial stuff, but the root stuff, the dub, the everything, you know? The reggae influence started to reach the New York punk bands as well. music. Uh, we took a lot of nourishment from it on many levels, much of which was based around the Rastafarian sense of spirituality and the smoking of herb, uh, two killer combinations for the mid-70s. We make it down a yard and export it over broad. Mix it down on tape and transfer it to record. Reggae gone international. As some may tell you, reggae gone multinational. Roxanne, you don't have to go on the red line. It seemed as if every punk rocker started to walk with a skank. The new openness to reggae rhythms was to prove infectious and often more commercially acceptable for a mass audience than hardcore punk, certainly in Britain. The Kingston Studios could afford to upgrade. Punk interest had helped to establish reggae as a lasting influence on rock and roll, despite the tragically early death of Bob Marley himself. trying to make a statement, we were a statement, you know, in itself we were. If you went to Balsaheath and grabbed eight guys, the chances are it's the kind of mix that you find in UB40. We started up in a cellar, except we wanted the chords to sound good. You know, we didn't know what they were called. We wanted to replace a lot of punk energy with, with a finesse. That's not too pompous. Around our neighbourhood and like other inner cities, there wasn't anywhere to hear reggae music. There wasn't any specific places. So they used to just keep house parties, which was known as blues parties. And they used to start up like um, either Thursday or Friday night and then finish Monday morning. With reggae, you had to. Uh participate audience-wise, because um, the more people in the room, the deeper the bass got. Uh, that was the fun of it. I mean, they just threw away the volume control. Total heaven. 
Meanwhile, the Pistols themselves were increasingly frustrated at being unable to play live in Britain. Arguing bitterly among themselves, they decided to make a full-out attack on America. I was asked for the group to play at Madison Square Garden. Sid by then had become a heroin addict. For a variety of reasons, I thought it might be more interesting to play in the South, in tiny little venues. There'd be no point in playing to uh, the north of America, you know, the New Yorks, because you'd be really just preaching to the converted. You should always go where you're not wanted first. There's more to achieve. Man. Yeah, they're garbage. The pistols are just out of sight. I think they got a lot of balls. It's about time we got some street fighting men here in America. It's about time we got someone to rile the people up. I think I heard one time that they urinate on the audience one time. Why, I don't know. It just sounds goofy. What's your impression of America at this point? Load of shit. Inside this place, which was called Randy's Rodeo, virtually 2,000 Mexicans. And it was that part of Texas. Sex Pistols boarded the stage. Rotten climbed onto the mic. And suddenly, a giant hamburger leapt through the air and hit smack on Rotten's face. With ketchup sort of fell down on his rather nice blue tartan bondage suit that Vivian had made for the tour. He was pissed off. Who the hell did that, he said, pointing into the audience, outraged. Sid followed, typical of an agent provocateur, and said, all you cowboys are a bunch of faggots. That's all they needed. They rushed the stage, brandishing knives, guns going off in the background, and the stage rained non-stop, beer cans and hamburgers. I'll never forget Steve Jones. Kept, as these cans kept hurtling through the air, he would nut them back like a footballer. At some point, a guy managed to get so near the stage and brandished a kind of a bowie knife that Sid took the base and with the bottom half of it, he smacked it down on the top of this cowboy's head. He knew that I meant physical harm, and I have to say I was ugly about it. But he, he came out and hit us over the head with a face. He was hitting us because I was going like this. Come on, buddy. And he kept going like this. And I would have been glad to take him on or his buddy Johnny. The Pistols' kamikaze raid was starting to take its toll as they approached the hippie capital itself. By the time the Sex Pistols reached San Francisco, they were virtually not talking to each other. It was like, come and see the circus. The circus is in town, you know what I mean? I couldn't see any way of this continuing, and that's why it stopped when it did. <laughs> Ever get the feeling you've been cheated? Never get the feeling you've been cheated. That wasn't directed at the audience. That was directed at us on stage. Because we had been cheated and we cheated ourselves. As the end of the 70s approached, it seemed as if punk might have failed in its attempt to ever gain acceptance in mainstream America. For the original bands in New York, 
it was time to change if they were to survive. It occurred to us, well, you know, our songs are so weird. Maybe we should do a cover song on our next album. Maybe the radio will like it. Instead of just, uh, ah, uh, ah, all of a sudden you got something which is making your pelvis not only go in and out, but also side to side. And that would give it that little, that little, Mm, thing that Bernie Worrell would, would explain to me later, you know, I would say, now, please explain this to me in musical notation. He'd say, honey, it's like, it's like when you're with your lover and you just go, uh, you know, for that little, because you're just coming up to meet him. Sure enough, the, the radio did like it, and uh, I think it, it was our first top 40 single. The Ramones went into the studio with Phil Spector, who forced them, at gunpoint, to add strings. One band above all was to achieve radio play and commercial success. When I first met Blondie, they were a very dark, very strange, psychedelic surf punk band. One of the first songs they played me was uh, Heart of Glass. And Heart of Glass at that point sounded uh, like, once I had a love and it was a gas. It was a reggae song. Soon turned out and Heart of Glass. You know. And uh, and I said, well, this is a great song, but this, you know, Americans don't buy uh, reggae. There's no way they're going to buy it in reggae form. So let's try and change it. And uh, the way we presented the record was palatable to radio, and consequently palatable to the American audience and the world audience. You have to bear in mind that they just come out of the Vietnam War and the whole situation here was very, very different. Uh, America was in a, economically, a much, much better position than it is now. And it's funny that now that things are beginning to crumble and fall apart and their economy is going down the toilet, that they're turning a definite eye towards punk. Now they get it. I suppose, really, it's not the music for the overprivileged. States finally caught on about three or four years ago with the Nirvana phenomenon. There was a, a, a small film that uh, came out around then. It was a document of a tour of uh, Sonic Youth and Nirvana, and it was called 1990 or something, the year punk broke. And the, it was an accurate title because the, uh, it's almost as if in the States, at least, uh, more than 10 years after the fact, Finally, the radio stations and the media and whatnot realized that something was going on. And the, the uh, original groups, Clash and Sex Pistols and us and all, most of uh, most of us had long since disappeared. But uh, in a sense, we'd finally succeeded through these other, other groups.
Spitzel said, you know, don't listen to the bollocks. So, so it was, um, it, I think it's it was, bollocks, my dear. Is it bollocks? Bollocks. bollocks. And not bullocks. Bullocks. Yeah. Bullocks is a department store in San Francisco. <laughs> I was brought up in Shepherd's Bush, and I barely went to school. Last thing I'm thinking about, I didn't even know who the Prime Minister was. You know what I mean? I had any views on any of that stuff. And they was doing their thing, I, I don't care. I just want to play and uh, get hold of some birds, you know what I mean?